It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Renan Barthena from uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, Renan did his PhD in MIT in the Michigan and continued to a postdoc in the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Uh, then the uh, CETA in Toronto, then came back as faculty at Tel Aviv University. Uh, one of various prizes, he was a Guggenheim Fellow and Wolf Fellow. And uh, he will tell us today about uh, new types of searches for dark matter using a 21 centimeter signals. And so, okay, thank you. Good to be here. So, uh, today I will tell you about possibilities that maybe dark matter has been revealed by searching for the first stars in the universe. Okay, so let's start uh, from a little bit of background. So, uh, the method, the field with which uh, people are searching for the first stars is uh, called 21 centimeter cosmology. So, uh, the idea is to use the 21 centimeter line of the hydrogen atom. In the ground state of hydrogen, the proton and electron can have a spin that are aligned, uh, parallel or anti-parallel. There's a tiny energy difference between these two states. Uh, so, uh, this is the, the energy difference which uh, gives off the photon to the rate in the radio, 21 centimeter photon. The corresponding temperature is uh, very, very low. So, uh, we want to look at, at the universe at the time when the universe was full of hydrogen atoms, which were emitting or absorbing it in this uh, in this. <coughs> Now, uh, when we do uh, astronomy, when we look for uh, radio waves from this, uh, from this line, uh, what's most important, uh, what's most interesting is uh, called the spin temperature. So if you look at, uh, at hydrogen atoms out in the, in the intergalactic uh, space, uh, the, the abundance of atoms in the excited state compared to the ground state, so this ratio that has a factor of 3, which is a spin degeneracy factor, because this is spin 1 and spin 0, and then uh, normally you would have a Boltzmann factor, e to the minus uh, the energy difference divided in terms of temperature divided by the temperature of the gas. However, in uh, cosmology, uh, things are often at very low uh, densities, and you are not in uh, thermal interaction, thermal equilibrium. So uh, we define an effective temperature, which uh, which is just defined from this equation. So it's an effective temperature that describes the relative abundance of hydrogen atoms in the excited state compared to the ground state. So this is called the spin temperature. And uh, it's this temperature which describes, again, this relative ratio. And this ratio is what actually determines astronomical observations. So if light passes through a cloud of hydrogen, this ratio determines how much uh, absorption and emission we will get in this wavelength. So, uh, so we are interested in the spin temperature, so to understand what radio astronomers can probe with this uh, method, we have to understand what determines the spin temperature for hydrogen lying out uh, in the universe, outside of galaxies. So first of all, we have a Kalin micro background, the remnant of the, hot, of the early hot universe. Uh, CMB has photons in a wide range of wavelengths, uh, including uh, 20 centimeters. And uh, CMB scatters with hydrogen atoms, and uh, if this were the only interaction, uh, after a while, you would uh, tend to get thermal equilibrium between the, the hydrogen atom and the CMB, which means, or at least the 21 centimeter line in the CMB, which means that the spin temperature is driven towards the CMB temperature by these uh, scatterings. However, there's all, there are also other effects. So, uh, hydrogen atoms uh, scatter with each other, and in these scatters, you can have small uh, energy transfers. And the transfers are of order KT, where T is the, the normal kind of temperature, the kinetic temperature of the gas, which is just called T gas. So in, in these uh, scatterings, they drive the spin temperature to equilibrium with the, the normal gas temperature. And again, we're talking about very low density gas, uh, which, in, which often in, the, in cosmology is not in thermal equilibrium with the CMB. So the gas temperature is different for the CMB. And then uh, the question, the, the main question is which one of these wins? Because if the spin temperature goes to equilibrium with the CMB, then when you're observing a hydrogen atom in, in the background, of course you have a CMB coming from all directions in the sky, from the real universe. So if you have gas which is in equilibrium with the CMB, you can't see it. It's like trying to observe red dots on the red background. 
But once uh, the spin temperature is different, then you start to, to observe the early hydrogen. But what happens is that as the universe expands, densities go down, and it turns out that uh, this uh, effect starts to win over this effect, and uh, the hydrogen disappears. But luckily, there's another effect which allows us to do 21 centimeter cosmology uh, at, uh, you know, at interesting times. And that's a, a little bit of a complicated atomic physics effect, which uh, was worked out in the 1950s, so uh, you know, 50 years before uh, people realized the importance of this effect for cosmology. So today it's called the Waffeisen field effect, or WF effect. And it, it goes as follows. It says that suppose we have in the universe Lyman alpha photons. So in the hydrogen atom, Lyman alpha is n equals 1 to n equals 2 uh, position. It's uh, around the 10 electron volt uh, photon. It's very, very high energy compared to the tiny difference, which, uh, which we talk about, the 21 centimeter lines, uh, the hyperfine uh, splitting in the ground space. So there's a, an indirect coupling between Lyman alpha and the tiny 21 centimeter uh, energy difference, which, uh, which goes as follows. So Lyman alpha photons travel in the universe. Uh, most of the hydrogen is cold and it's uh, in the ground state. It, so it uh, resonantly absorbs Lyman with the Lyman alpha photons, goes to n equals 2, and then spontaneously goes back to um, n equals 1. And when uh, the hydrogen atom makes a transition back to n equals 1, emitting the Lyman alpha photon back, it can end up in a different hyperfine state than where it started. So indirectly, you mix up the, the bundles of these uh, 21 centimeter levels. And it turns out that uh, this process, so if you have Lyman alpha photons from whatever source, for example, from the first star, then uh, let's drive the spin temperature to the kinetic gas temperature. The reason that T gas uh, comes in is that each Lyman alpha photon, when you have a neutral universe, uh, which, uh, you know, everything is uh, atomic hydrogen, uh, a Lyman alpha photon sees a very, very high optical depth. It uh, scatters around a million times with different hydrogen atoms before the Lyman alpha photon redshifts out of the line due to the cosmological expansion. So in these uh, million scatterings, after a few scatterings, the Lyman alpha photon comes into a kind of uh, local equilibrium with the motion of the atoms, because it sees the, the hydrogen atoms moving with some speed, uh, which is determined by, by KT, the, the, temp the kinetic temperature, so it can get uh, the Lyman alpha photon energy can change by around KT. So that's how you get this equilibrium, and, and you drive the spin temperature to the gas temperature, which again turns on the, the signal for 21 centimeter cosmology if T gas is different from the CMB, which, I, which is our background source. So it works like this. So again, this is a type of the 21 centimeter transition. So uh, with a 21 centimeter resonance, we have this very nice thing that happens with Lyman alpha and other uh, atomic resonances. When you combine <coughs> an atomic resonance line with the, uh, with the expansion of cosmological redshift, you get this very nice cosmological tool. So if we look, look at some direction, again in the background, uh, there's always the CMB coming from all directions of the sky. But the CMB photons on the way to us along the line of sight. Wherever there's a hydrogen atom, the atom absorbs at this local 21 centimeter line. So if we observe a spectrum, if we just uh, uh, take a spectrum and observe the flux in radio at the function of wavelength, uh, each hydrogen atom or hydrogen cloud along the line of sight will absorb at this local 21 centimeter, but because the universe is expanding, <coughs> the, pho the photon wavelength is expanding with the universe. So, for example, a hydrogen cloud at redshift Z1 observed at 21 centimeter, but by the time it comes to us, this uh, wavelength has, has uh, expanded, has been multiplied by 1 plus Z1, and uh, a hydrogen atom that is farther away and to the CMB passed through it earlier at, at higher redshift Z2, we will see that the different wavelength, 21 times 1 plus Z2. So when we take a spectrum, we see uh, the whole uh, distribution along the line of sight of these hydrogen clouds. So uh, spectra give you the line of sight direction. The CMB covers the whole sky. So in this game, you don't actually have to look for sources. You have an all sky background. So that's uh, two dimensions, and the line of sight is the third dimension. So the big promise of 21 centimeter cosmology is to produce a 3D map 
of the distribution of hydrogen in the universe, at least at early times, when the hydrogen was, uh, was atomic, not ionized. Now, in this talk, I, I, I won't have uh, many equations at all, but I want to just present uh, the basic equation of 21 centimeter cosmology. And this equation gives, uh, this, this is called the, the 20 centimeter brightness temperature. This is basically the radio intensity, the intensity of emission or absorption uh, along uh, in some direction. And in radio astronomy, uh, people um, describe intensity as the units of temperature because we're, uh, in radio astronomy we are at very low uh, energies, which is the, the low frequency uh, limit of the Planck spectrum, where you have a Rayleigh genes, the Rayleigh genes limit. And in the Rayleigh genes limit, the intensity is proportional to the black body temperature. So uh, radio astronomers use the Rayleigh genes limit. Uh, to define an, an effective temperature for the intensity. It's just a proportional, so to measure intensity in units of temperature, in Kelvin, or usually uh, here would be millikelvin. So this is just the radio intensity of the, of the 20 centimeter line. So it's about 27 millikelvin. Now this is the absorption of the CMB. The CMB is at 2.7 Kelvin. So the optical depth is around uh, 1% for, for, for gas of the mean density. But then, uh, this, the intensity depends on several things which you can probe. So, this is uh, XH1 is what fraction of the hydrogen is H1, still atomic. So, once you have uh, ionization, once you have reionization, um, the, the, you know, some of the atoms get ionized by UV photons from stars or quasars, and then you can observe this because the 21 si uh, standard signals will disappear where you have ionized gas. I don't know if Adi is here, but Adi, of course, is a local guy who's uh, made major contribution to realization and the twin seminar cosmology. So this is one thing that you uh, that you uh, probe ionization. Another thing is uh, gas. So this is proportional to the gas density relative to the mean cosmic mean density. So where you have denser gas, you have stronger absorption, and so you're sensitive to <coughs> density fluctuations, which are primordial. Uh, you know, we, will, we think that, and, you know, based on the CMB, uh, density fluctuations have been around from ver the very early universe, so this is a cosmological probe of density fluctuations. Then you have some cosmological constant, the Hubble parameter, the uh, de mean density in the universe uh, in, in relative to the critical density omega of the variance and of the total matter. There's a small uh, weak redshift dependence, but the major uh, the major term that I will focus on is this one. So this is the spin temperature minus the CMB temperature divided by the spin temperature. So this is how the 20 centimeter signal depends on the spin temperature. Again, the effective temperature of the 21 centimeter line. So uh, this, uh, this simple term uh, is quite important because it says, so if the spin temperature equals the CMB temperature, then you have, again, this uh, thermal equilibrium with your background, so you don't see anything, you get zero. And if, uh, if the spin temperature is, is above, then you get emission, and if it's below, this becomes negative, because we're measuring the signal relative to the CMB. So you get absorption if, if the gas is colder than the CMB, and you get extra emission if the gas is hotter than the CMB. But the, the important thing is that this term shows, uh, this dependence shows a very strong asymmetry between hot and cold gas. If you have very hot gas, if Ts goes to infinity, this whole thing uh, approaches 1 and becomes independent of temperature. So that's called saturated heating. If you have very hot gas, you just get some <coughs> maximum signal. However, however, if you have very cold gas, if Ts goes to 0, then you get minus TCMB over Ts, and Ts is very small, this goes to minus infinity. Basically, you can have a very, very strong negative signal, very strong absorption. So absorption can be much stronger than the maximum possible emission signal. And, uh, and I was uh, using TS as a, as a, as a temperature. So, so there's also the question of whether the TS equals the gas temperature, the, the regular kinetic gas temperature. And that depends on, on, on coupling processes like the Waldheim field effect from Lyman alpha photons, which couples the spin temperature to the gas temperature. And then TS is just the, the regular gas temperature. So basically you measure, it's a thermometer, you can measure uh, temperature fluctuations as well. 
Okay, so this is a very exciting field because the, the, the signal should come, should be, which, there should be a significant signal from a period when the first stars began to form and, and uh, quasars and, and many, er, the, basically the earliest uh, times of, of star formation, of object of formation, of astrophysics in the universe. And these are times from which there are almost no observational constraints. So uh, it's a very exciting to be able to open up this, uh, this, uh, this time in Calvin history to observations. So there are many people uh, trying to detect the signal. And there are two uh, very different observation strategies. So one strategy is called global 21 centimeter experiments. And these are uh, fairly simple and uh, fairly low cost experiments. You basically one uh, radio antenna. Now it has, these antennas have some strange shape because uh, that, so when you have one antenna, you don't have any directional information. You just measure the overall radio intensity on the sky, but you measure it as a function of wavelengths, which corresponds to different redshifts because each each redshift, uh, you know, each wavelength is 21 centimeter times one plus the redshift. So you you take a spectrum and then you hope to see how on average, you look, you look averaging over the sky, which means that you're basically averaging over the universe at each redshift over a big shell. Okay. But you hope to see how uh, things change as a function of time throughout the universe. And they'll show uh, there's, there, you know, there are major transitions that should have had a cosmological and an overall effect on the entire universe. So basically, you design the antenna so that the antenna itself doesn't give you any features. So its response needs to be very smooth as a function of wavelength or frequency, so that any changes with the, with frequency are are actually cosmological. So uh, so these are stars as uh, people that in India and RRI in India. Uh, the experiment itself is in Australia, but these are uh, people from the U.S. from Arizona State University. So uh, what theoretically do we expect to see? for the global uh, 20 centimeter signal. So this is a paper with my students, um, which we wrote with, where we tried to, to say the following. So the, the idea is that we're talking about quite early times. So this is one plus redshift. So we're going from redshift six to around 35. Uh, we're talking about times from, for which uh, there are very few observations, and there are some observations of galaxies uh, you know, after redshift uh, 10 and a little bit beyond, uh, very few. But uh, the bulk of the galaxy and the star formation you cannot see at these high redshift. And especially when you want to, to predict something happening in redshift 15 or 20. Uh, so my approach is to be very cautious, very skeptical that we are able to, to extrapolate from our current knowledge of low redshift to what happens in high redshift. So we should keep an open mind. And, uh, and what we did is to uh, parameterize the, the possible pro properties of astrophysics at these early times and consider a very wide range of possible uh, astrophysical parameters to know what, are the ra what is the, the range of possible signals that people will see. So what, what I'm showing here, this is the, again, the 20 centimeter bright temperature. So this is the intensity of the signal uh, measured in units of temperature in millikelvin. Zero means uh, equal, the, the, the intensity, the 20 centimeter equals the CMB, so you see nothing. This is emission and this is absorption. And this is the function of 1 plus the redshift, which uh, corresponds to frequency in terms of your experiment, your observation. So what I'm showing here are, are around 200 combinations of, of models. Uh, by now we have tens of thousands, but uh, the, whole, the entire range is about the same, because we chose these prior combinations to cover the entire uh, feasible range, reasonable range. So there are lots of different curves, but one of them is highlighted just as an example, because Although there are lots of possibilities, we see this is one curve, and this is another curve, or there are many, there's a wide range here, but all of them have pretty much the same overall shape. Okay, it's only the, the exact uh, size and position of, of the points, uh, of the, you know, the, the key inflection points are different, but the overall shape <coughs> is similar, and the reason is as follows. So if you go to very high redshift, this is the dark ages. So back here, uh, these redshifts, uh, there aren't enough uh, st stars, there isn't enough astrophysics to have any effect. So here it's, uh, it's called the dark ages. But once stars begin to form, uh, so very generically, regardless of the uncertainty in the parameters of the, of the astrophysics, 
the first thing that happens is that even a, a, a small background of Lyman alpha photons is enough to start producing this Wadheisen field effect and start coupling uh, the 21 centimeter line to the gas temperature. Now at these redshifts, the gas in the universe is much colder than the CMB because uh, through the expansion, through adiabatic cooling, the gas cools faster than the CMB. So the gas is cold and once you get coupling, these curves become, become uh, more and more negative. You get strong absorption because the gas is colder than the CMB and the spin temperature is reflecting the gas temperature once you have this coupling, this line off the coupling. So if you follow the white curve, you, get, you start going and get uh, strong and strong absorption. <coughs> now at some point, you, you, uh, when you have this coupling, the coupling uh, has a saturation point because the most you can do is to couple the spin temperature to the gas temperature, and that's it. There's nothing more you can do. So the spin temperature equals the gas temperature. That's as cold as you can get. And also, at about the same time, uh, normally you start having enough x-rays from uh, most likely from uh, stellar remnants, from uh, black hole binaries uh, mainly at these, uh, at these early times, you get enough x-rays to begin warming up the gas in the universe. So if you warm up the gas, it's not so cold relative to the CMB anymore, and the absorption begins to decline. So this is the warming of the universe, the early cosmic heating. Now in some models, you warm enough to go above the CMB temperature, and then you have an emission region. In other models, uh, if you have late heating, you never heat, and, uh, like in these models, you just, uh, you're always uh, below zero. But in any case, at these, uh, these directions, we know that the universe goes through cosmic realization, from probably stars, maybe qu uh, quasars as well. Uh, so realization means the uh, UV photons ionizing the gas, getting rid of hydrogen atoms, so the signal goes to zero, either from above or from below. But the general shape, except for this uh, difference, one, uh, one diff binary difference, uh, all the curves have a similar shape. And the only question is which curve is correct. And you can see so the signal can be weak or strong and occur at different frequencies. So the observer should, have, should keep an open mind. Excuse me. Yes. How do you know uh, in, the, in the measurement that it's 21 centimeter? If you have uh, such a wide range, so that's a very, very good question. Supplies. So that's a good question. So in the global, so the, so the, the global approach has an, has an advantage that it's, uh, it's very cheap and well, not necessarily easy. Uh, in all of these experiments, they're not easy because in, in these radio wavelengths, where there's a, there are very strong local signals, mostly cyclotron radiation from our own uh, Milky Way. So that's the difficulty. The, the cosmological signal, you have to separate it from uh, the local foreground. Uh, but uh, Beyond that, if you can do it, and if you can measure this, then with the global signal, you don't really have any cross-checks that you can do. So, uh, so I'll talk about the other approach, where you do have additional checks to see that it's going to send. So it's true that in the global uh, case, uh, the main idea is that we don't know any other, any other either astrophysical or cosmological effect. No one has, has uh, calculated uh, something that could produce this kind of signal. So, but, so, you know, we, that, that's the best you can do with a global signal, but eventually you, you hope to see the fluctuation signal, and there you have a lot more information. So the other approach, which is also being pursued... I want to find some recombination. The gas is cold, right? No, like enough uh, photons that I'm talking about is just from stars. Stellar, the stellar UV. Ah, the early stars are just enough uh, like enough. So the other approach, which also is being uh, pursued very vigorously, is uh, fluctuation experiments. So one of them, uh, uh, one of, so actually the leading experiment right now is, uh, is active, is LOFAR, which Salim Zarubi is part of. But um, if we're talking about cosmic dawn, about, uh, about earlier times, high redshift, these are the major experiments that hope to, uh, to measure the fluctuation experiment. So the fluctuation means to have a, a, a big array of radio telescopes or radio antennas where eventually, so in the SKA case, you have uh, many thousands of simple antennas that are all connected together just digitally as if it's one big radio telescope. And here you actually produce, hope to produce an image of the, on the sky of the distribution of the intensity from the different directions, also the function of redshift, basically a 3D map as I was talking about before. Now, if you have this, then, uh, then you just, I mean, with a global experiment, you only have one number at every region, just the mean intensity. So there's no way to, to produce a cross-check except that, you know, if you see the whole signal, you hope to see 
a shape which is similar to what was theoretically predicted. And again, we don't have any other idea of how to produce such a feature from something else at those wavelengths. But if, uh, if uh, once these fluctuation experiments succeed, you'll have a whole power spectrum of fluctuations at each redshift. It's a huge amount of information. You have a slope of the power spectrum, a shape, and functional redshift. So there, there just should be so much detail that it, it should be very obvious if, uh, if the data fits, uh, fits the model. And there are all kinds of cross-checks that the theorists <coughs> come up with to, to verify that we see the thing. So this will eventually will be uh, you know, much more information. But uh, the global, but one thing about the interferometer is that interferometers only measure differences in the sky. They actually don't measure the global, the mean intensity. So the global signal, uh, first of all, it may it may succeed first and be the first, uh, you know, the first discovery. But also the global signal, in any case, is complementary. It measures uh, something additional that the fluctuation experiments uh, don't. So uh, the square kilometer array is the, the biggest uh, international experiment. <coughs> which eventually should, should do the, everything uh, very, very well. But this uh, will probably start getting data in around 2025. And there are other efforts before, so the, the major one is HERA, which is again a kind of a, a US-Australian uh, effort, and the telescope itself is in, in all of these are in Australia, in, in the Australian desert, uh, to be far away from, from terrestrial radio interference. <coughs> so HERA is already uh, moving forward, and. In about a year or two, it may start having uh, significant data from, uh, from very high redshift, from uh, cosmic dawn, basically redshift 20. And uh, if it succeeds, it, it could produce uh, you know, a very good uh, power spectra. What is the difference between the two? So the difference is that HERA is a much smaller experiment. Uh, I think it's something like $10 million level, <coughs> specifically targeting this, uh, this subject. The square cloud array is a general purpose radio observatory for, which will affect all of astronomy and it's <coughs> half a billion euros just for the first stage. So it's a, it's a much, much bigger thing, which, which also has an advantage. So that for, in terms of foreground removal, SKA will have much more information on the sky and much more ability to remove uh, foregrounds uh, you know, very systematically. So HERA relies to some degree on uh, let's see, algorithms to remove the foreground from the data sort of in processing. So, uh, in principle, the sensitivity should be similar, but HERA has uh, basically uh, you know, less room to, or more room to fail. It's, it's more possible that HERA will not succeed in reaching this, the projected sensitivity. But HERA is happening uh, soon. Okay, but uh, in this talk, I will I want to focus on uh, the edges low experiment, which is. Uh, yeah. Edges, so the Edges team, again, it's, uh, they're in the University of Arizona State University in the U.S. And they had their high uh, experiment in the low experiment. The low is for low frequency. It's a twice as large uh, antenna. Basically, so this is kind of the, the antenna, the, the receiver is underneath here. And there's a, wesh, a mesh of, of uh, electrical wires trying to reduce some of the effect of the ground on the signal. So you can see here the big uh, wire mesh. And they were basically the first to very seriously uh, try to observe uh, high, very high redshift, what we call cosmic dawn, like redshift 20. Some, uh, like really the, the first uh, large, uh, the first significant uh, population of star formation of stars in the universe, the theoretical. So the basic idea of what they, uh, the basic uh, uh, result of what they found is that, uh, so here again I'm trying the 20 centimeter intensity, the function of frequency. And uh, these curves are something similar to all the, the array of curves that I showed before. And uh, the edges, the uh, best fit signal is basically the red thing. So even though I was uh, saying that we need to be very cautious and, and consider a wide range of possibilities, the measurement that they claim is well, well outside all of the possibilities. So uh, it was a big uh, surprise, very strong absorption. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the, it's the first uh, claimed detection in this entire field. It's, uh, again, a very, very hard measurement, so uh, it's controversial. And, and uh, you know, right now, um, the status is that we're awaiting further confirmation. But I want to talk in some detail about what they, they found. So, so in the actual spectrum that they observe, this is the, the brightness temperature and the function of frequency. So you see it's actually a few thousand Kelvin. Because one, actually, all of the experiments observed is our own galaxy. 
But the nice thing, the, the reason that people are investing in this, and the reason it's not hopeless to see a 10 Kelvin uh, signal, uh, sorry, 10 millikelvin signal in the 3000 Kelvin background, uh, the reason is that, the, that for, we know that even theoretically, the synchrotron radiation from a single electron has a smooth spectrum at, at these frequencies. And the, the real signal, as I showed you, has fluctuations in it. So uh, the idea, so this is the idea of, of, of removing any smooth uh, part, any, any part of the signal that has a smooth spectrum, and being left with fluctuation, which hopefully are the cosmological signal. And at least theoretically, the difference should, you should be able to do this. I, you know, if, uh, if you can understand your, if you calibrate your instrument and get over systematic, uh, you should have easily have enough signal to noise to do the separation. Because we know that the synchrotron foreground, even though it's, it's very bright, it should, be, it should have a very smooth spectrum. So this is what they observe. Now, uh, before I go to the results, I just want to note uh, that if you take the... Just to show what happens, if you do a very, very elementary first, uh, uh, first kind of... Uh, for, uh, foreground subtraction. So what you do is you take this. Uh, we know it's the circuit turn from our galaxy is a is a power is a uh, power ball spectrum, basically frequency to minus two point five or two point six. So you, you divide by this by power this power law, you get something close to, to a straight line, and then you remove a straight line, which is a, is a two term polynomial. So if you just do that, uh, this is what you're left with. So this is the, the residual after the, the tiniest uh, initial kind of removal of a smooth component. So this is just to, to, uh, to emphasize that so this is the Kelvin. So you have about basically a one Kelvin uh, roughly feature in the data. Of course, the only question is whether this feature, this leftover, is uh, this residual is a foreground residual or a cosmological signal. That's the question. But just uh, because of some some criticism that people have made, just to, I just want to make it clear that the one Kelvin signal is in the data. It's not something that was somehow created by, by a foreground modeling or, or removal. So it's in the data, but the question is whether this itself comes from uh, unremoved uh, foreground residual. Okay, but what they actually did is they, they removed the foreground model that has uh, five turns, not two turns. And uh, according to their, uh, you know, so their uh, simulation of their own instrument and, and calibration and so on and, and measurements in the lab, that they need a five-term uh, model to, to get, to remove most of the foreground as it's being processed by the instrument. And this is the residuals that they measure, and this is the RMS, 87 uh, millikelvin. And if you remove the foreground model plus a 21 centimeter, 21 centimeter model, the residuals go way down, and you're left basically with the noise. And I'll show more about it in a second. The best fit model of the, 20, of the real cosmological signal looks like this kind of absorption uh, feature. And this is a signal plus residual. So what the best fit model is basically uh, half uh, Kelvin. What is the foreground model? So the foreground model that they use is simply, well, I'll show, I'll show it in a second. <coughs> to some degree, just a polynomial, uh, I mean, the simplest one is a polynomial frequency. But I'll show, I'll show it in a minute in more detail. Okay, this is another uh, plot from their work, so this is John Bauman et al. So, the, so black is the, the main, is this basically one, but, and these are different results from uh, various, uh, so they, they spent basically had more than six months making all kinds of systematic variations in the, in the instrument to see that the signal seems to remain and it's not some instrumental effect. So you see that the, the fluctuations are not large, and I'll talk in a minute about what these different uh, things vary in the instrument. I just want to note here that the, the one issue, which is another um, you know, a reasonable uh, reason for, for some skepticism, is that the model that we found uh, is a, looks, the shape looks a bit different than what theoret theoretical models predict. So basically it's, it's very, it has sharp edges and a flat bottom. While the uh, models, that, which I'll show uh, in a minute, uh, predict a more Gaussian shape. So this is something that may be a little bit of a, of a problem. It's not clear yet uh, completely how, how robust this result is. For example, if you look at this orange curve, it doesn't, it doesn't really have this flat bottom. So it's not clear how robust the shape is, but this is uh, something cautionary to, to keep in mind. So basically, uh, the, so 
some of the checks they, they made, uh, they have they produced a separate copy of the instrument, of the whole instrument, very the, the size of this ground plane, which affects the, how the ground uh, interacts with the experiment. Change, look at different positions, orientation of the telescope, different analysis pipelines. So in Fordham models, uh, so you have the basically new to the minus 2.5 of the synchrotron. And then, uh, so one, one model that people use, it's just a simple polynomial, you know, other than new to the minus 2.5, just a polynomial. Uh, they had a, what they call a kind of a physically motivated uh, Fordham model that uh, results from some uh, expectation about the effect of the ionosphere, but also has five, uh, five coefficients. And this is the main uh, Fordham model that they use. Uh, also, accordingly, they looked at how the signal varied with position of the sun, moon, and the galaxy to see that you don't have some systematic effects from, from these uh, things. And, and basically, uh, what I want to show, so I, mean, I don't have too much time, I want to talk a little bit about the interpretation. So I just want to briefly uh, show I think the, the, main, the two main arguments that maybe what they've really seen a, a, a real signal. So one argument is to look at the residual RMS uh, noise of fluctuation as a function of the integration time. So if, if you're really limited by noise, you expect a 1 over root uh, time, integration time, RMS. And if the model is just a formal model, this saturates. And if they include the, the 20 centimeter model, then it's more consistent with being noise. So there are some systematic residuals. Of course, it's still the question of whether it's a, a cosmological residual. And the argument for this is uh, a plot that I made based on data that they had in the table, but I think worth plotting to, to emphasize this result. So what this shows is the best fit amplitude of the 20 millimeter signal as a function of the sky temperature or the, the average foreground level. So the point is that they're observing the whole sky, but still the level of the <coughs> foreground varies with time because it's coming from our galaxy and the center of our galaxy goes above and below the horizon. So actually they, they make, take measurements when the, when our, when the foreground varies by a factor of 3. So the best data is, is here when the galaxy is below the horizon. So this is uh, basically the, the best data, and this is a plus or minus 1 sigma for the amplitude. And then uh, they take data also, so, so normally you, you just show your best data, but they're looking for systematic, so they're also showing data under conditions when the sky is much brighter. Now, uh, first let me just say that the, the green and blue points are not independent. It's the same data with slightly different binning and analysis. So you, you, you can actually take either the blue points or the, or the green points. <coughs> the point is that the, the major worry with this is that the residual is some unsubtracted residual from the foreground. So the foreground goes for the, the instrument and the, leaves some feature which is unsubtracted. But if it's a foreground residual, you would expect its uh, amplitude to be roughly proportional to the foreground. And if it were proportional, it would be within this uh, in this, within this range. But instead, it seems to be uh, this, the best fit signal amplitude is constant to within plus or minus one sigma, regardless of the size of the foreground. So this is, uh, I think, the strongest argument that this is not a foreground residual. But, it's, but you know, it's limited data, so, so we'll have to see what happens. Now, uh, of course, uh, the biggest test will be an independent confirmation of this. We don't have that yet. The, the, what I can show here is some preliminary, still unpublished, so it's just it's preliminary uh, data from the same group with a different <coughs> instrument, what they call the mid instrument, which is uh, which is a, has a different antenna size, so it, it has uh, it's sensitive to some different uh, a different frequency range. So this is the, same, the residuals that I showed before, and this is the idea of the residuals from their other instrument, and and the the best feature is consistent and. It doesn't seem to have shifted with the, the shift in the frequency range of the instrument. So this is preliminary, and they're exploring these two instruments together, and uh, I'm sure they will soon uh, you know, publish this, uh, what seems to be a, a, an independent confirmation by the same group. Of course, we're waiting for other groups to catch up, and, and many are trying to, to independently measure this. Okay, but uh, I have just a short <coughs> amount of time to talk about the interpretation. So uh, the idea is that, uh, so these are uh, examples of some astroph a few astrophysical models. And the point is that from, from this equation, uh, so I, I won't go through the detail, but from this equation you can very simply, in a very, uh, very simple way, um, 
prove that the signal cannot be stronger than this. It cannot be below. You, get, you cannot get stronger absorption than this line uh, uh, from standard astrophysics. And what they measured is much stronger absorption at, at about a 4 sigma statistical significance. So the question is, how can you get stronger absorption? So they asked me if I had any idea. Because that was one reason for them to be very cautious, that they didn't have any interpretation, any possible explanation. So I focused on this term and noted that if the gas is colder than anyone expected, then this could produce stronger absorption. Now, the point is that, it, that having gases even colder is, is very surprising because the people who come up with all kinds of uh, exotic ideas for all kinds of early I don't know, black hole formation, dark matter annihilation, all kinds of things. But all of them tend to produce heating and ionization, which only makes the signal weaker, not stronger. So to cool the gas is very unnatural. Something else must have cooled it down, something which was even colder than the gas. Now the point is that at these redshifts at cosmic dawn, this is a very special time in cosmic history when the universe is as cold as it will ever be, because the gas has been cooling down adiabatically, and astrophysics has not yet heated it back up. So this is the coldest it will ever be, and, the gas, and whatever cooled it must have been even colder than, than 5 Kelvin according to the observation. So uh, I realized that the, the only plausible, um, plausible cosmological component is the cold dark matter, which can be very, very cold. But for, for it to cool down the gases, there has to be some coupling between them. So people had, uh, had thought about um, the idea of all kinds of, of possible dark matter interactions. I mean, there are people that study you know, all possible properties of dark matter and can we rule them out or not. But uh, nobody <coughs> considered uh, the uh, cosmic dawn. Uh, the closest people came was to look at the cooling during the dark age, before <coughs> the astrophysics uh, form. And in the, in the study that I was working on, the cosmic dawn, you know, we, we, as I mentioned, we've, been, we've known that this uh, line of coupling from the first star should produce a strong absorption signal, which you should, which you should be able to see. Uh, but to explain the data, if the data is correct, you need the combination of these two things. You need some cooling interaction with the dark matter and the coupling from cutting down, and then you get this very strong absorption. Okay, so let me, let me continue uh, <coughs> a little bit. So once you include dark matter in, uh, scattering with, the, with the baryons, so these are for different uh, dark matter masses, so these same models before give you uh, absorption which is much stronger because the gas is colder and you can get absorption as, as strong as observed uh, by, as claimed by edges and uh, also this is a very high redshift, about 100 during the dark ages it's possible in some models to get very strong uh, signals if the gas was cool, if the gas cooled early on but the observationally this would be very, very hard to, to see maybe you know, someday from the far side of the moon but the nice thing is that, regardless of the details of the dark matter interaction, if there is such an interaction which pulls the gas, you get, uh, you get uh, limits on the cross-section of interaction. So this is a cross-section at a relative velocity of one kilometer per second between the baryon and dark matter particle. And on the mass of the dark matter particle, because if the dark matter particles are, are heavy, then, then we, know how much, we know the density of dark matter in the universe. So if the particles are heavy, it means that the number of dark matter particles is very low. Now energy goes as nkt. So if you have a small number of dark matter particles, even if the baryons share their energy with them, it, it won't change the temperature very much. So it implies that the basic dark matter cannot be heavier than a few GeV, than a few times hydrogen. And that would be very interesting because the leading idea for, for dark matter is WIMPs, which tend to be more like 100 or at least uh, 10 or 20 G. And if you could verify this, it would be very interesting for, for this guy as well, because uh, until today, dark matter, of course, uh, one of the criticisms is everything we know about dark matter is based on our understanding of gravity. So as one said, uh, if you can find a different interaction, a non-gravitational uh, hint for the existence of dark matter, that would also verify that we do understand gravity in cosmology. Uh, let me mention that there's one alternative class of uh, possible interpretations because in a minute, so the last, uh, the last slide or two will be on the fact that if you try to interpret this, uh, this with dark matter cooling, you need 
Dagner to have a, a property that we didn't know about before, the scattering with variance. So there are many, many uh, constraints on the possible properties of Dagner of that form. So there's a different type of explanation, which is, I think, less strongly constrained. And that is, going back to this basic uh, dependence within the 20 millimeter intensity, instead of lowering the gas temperature, you can increase the CMB temperature by saying that instead of just the CMB, we're not seeing the uh, we're not seeing the absorption relative to the CMB, but relative to a radio background, or some uh, radio background which is a, much higher than the CMB. So if you have a low frequency radio background in place by retro 20, you can also uh, explain this signal. So this has been explored a little bit. Uh, so uh, Bauman and already in their paper, in their paper, they mentioned this possible interpretation, and this has been looked at by many people. For example, Fanny Holder. <coughs> noted that today there's an observed radio axis of the cosmological uh, uh, extragalactic radio background, for example, observed by this NASA balloon, and you need only 10%, and actually even uh, probably flat, more like 1% of this observed radio axis. If it was already in, in place at Rex 20, it would give you this, uh, this explanation, this enhanced radio background. Now, just a word on this axis. So, in terms of, it's not really clear if there's any extragalactic radio axis. So, some others have, have modeled, because really what you do is uh, when you observe this axis, you, you observe radio background, and then you, you subtract the contribution of the Milky Way, and you're left with the residual. Now, the residual has exactly the same spectrum as the Milky Way, which already should you know, sound a little bit suspicious. But okay, maybe everything is coming from synchrotron, and, and you always get this spectrum. But uh, people who have carefully modeled the, the galaxy suggest that there's no evidence for access. It might just be the Milky Way. But certainly, we cannot rule out an access. So it's possible that there's an access radio background that was around early on. If you want to produce this background with early galaxies, then you need a, a very high radio background, basically like uh, what we see from the Milky Way today, but you need it around the retro 20. And that would mean that galaxies back then would have to be about a thousand times more efficient in producing red and earth and low frequency radio waves than galaxies today. And it's also possible to explain this with uh, you know, some kind of dark matter effect. So that's one possibility. But going back to the dark matter, to the interpretation with dark matter variant cooling, uh, if this occurs, then the, the only way to make this work is if the interaction, the the, the scattering rate between dark matter variants depends on temperature, on the relative velocity. Mm -hmm. Now, in cosmology, we expect the velocities of variants in dark matter to, to be different. So this is an example of a theoretical uh, you know, a map of the relative uh, velocity between variants in dark matter in different positions. In this pattern, uh, if you have this cooling, which <coughs> depends on the velocity, you will, you will expect to see this kind of pattern in, in 21 centimeters. So it makes a major prediction, which can be tested once, you, once the interferometer experiments observe the intensity maps. Um, so, so, I think I'm sort of running out of time. Let me just mention that, so that just two, two final things. So one is that, <coughs> that this is a random model including dark matter variant interactions. Now, uh, so what's shown here are all these uh, breakers. So this is, uh, not showing for the fluctuation experiment. What is the typical fluctuation on some uh, scale, of, on, a large, on large scales that can be measured by the SKA and by error? So what is the RMS fluctuation as a function of frequency or one plus ratio? So gray curves are curves which uh, their global signal matches the, the measurement by edges. And these are, these are, this is the range of predictions for the fluctuation. Compared to the black curve, so the black curve is the maximum fluctuation that you can get in standard models. So you see you can get uh, up to two orders of magnitude stronger uh, fluctuations in the standard model. And actually, I mean here, at right, these cosmic dawn redshifts are around 20. And there are a number of uh, experiments, ACE and NENUFAR, which now have a new incentive. And in, in the next year or two, they're planning to, to try to measure uh, this range of fluctuations uh, at these frequencies. And, you know, either you know, verify or rule out these types of uh, non-standard models. Excuse me? Yes. What are the main constraints on the couplings of the variants to the dark matter? So uh, this is what I'm talking about now. So the last, this is the last part, which is uh, what what do you, what happens if you try to to build particle physics models for this uh, interaction? 
So what I did in, in my proposal is to consider uh, the, the interaction with the dagger and the variance with all known constraints on it. And I found that you can satisfy all the constraints and, and explain the signal. However, when you actually pr produce, try to build a, a, a real particle mass to this model, uh, it becomes very hard and there are many other constraints. Because if you have a new interaction between the dagger and variance, in, in most models, this would imply that the same interaction can work between variants and themselves. And there are very strong uh, constraints in this, which is basically called the fifth force. And, uh, and also, dark matter would interact with itself with this new interaction. And there are many constraints in this, because if dark matter interacts with itself, it, it, it won't act like cold dark matter. So it's very hard to build uh, models for this. Uh, one model which, uh, which seems uh, reasonable and, and is possible is to have uh, is to not create a new interaction, but just have electrostatic interaction. So if you give the dark matter a tiny electric charge, it would just uh, electric electro electrostatically interact with the baryons, with the electrons mostly. And uh, but even in that case, uh, there are constraints that show that uh, the, the dark matter cannot all be uh, milli charged, only some fraction of the dark matter. But then it can work. So this milli charge model was uh, proposed by Munoz and Loeb. And they look at the constraints that you get on the dark matter particle mass, the, rel the charge relative to the electron, so it's a milli charge, a tiny charge, and what fraction of the dark matter could be described this way. And then uh, papers with, uh, so I had a collaboration with particle physicists, and there was a, a separate paper that we, we looked at all possible models and showed that uh, right now, other than this milli charge model, it seems very hard to construct any kind of new interaction. There's just too many constraints. So finally, uh, in, in this uh, collaboration that I had with Eli Kovac and other uh, with the CMB and uh, astroparticle people, we looked at this milli-charge uh, milli model, and I think this is uh, the current uh, possible uh, parameter space. So you see all the different constraints. So we worked out in detail the, the CMB constraint. So this is the, the mass of the dark matter particle, again, the charge relative to the electron. And this is what fraction of the dark matter. So the most can be about half a percent. And the minimum uh, can be about uh, 10 to the minus 4 of the dark matter. And then, so it can, it can be a small fraction of the dark matter, which can explain this. And the last comment uh, is, uh, is really just a, just a provocative uh, uh, thing that we noticed. Um, it's not really uh, anything to make of uh, too much at this point. It's, it's just an example of how a model like this, like this could be independently verified. So if you look at the best measured uh, cosmic variant density from the CMB and compare it to the best measurement from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, there's a bit of a discrepancy, which is around 2 sigma at the moment, where the, the variant density measured from the CMB seems to be a bit higher than for the BBN. And this would, make, this would be consistent with this kind of scenario, because if, the, if you have a little bit of newly charged dark matter, uh, so dark matter is not, uh, no, it's not baryonic, it will not it would not participate in nucleosynthesis, but it would be coupled to the gas and move with the gas, and so for the CMB purposes, it would uh, look like baryons. So this is consistent with roughly half a percent of, of the dark matter, but it's really only a very, uh, it's not statistically significant uh, at the moment, so it's just something to keep, to keep uh, our eye on in the future. Okay, so uh, briefly to summarize, uh, we have uh, this edges low, uh, the first plane detection of, uh, of a 20 10 year signal from uh, the early universe. The amplitude is surprisingly strong compared to standard models. One interpretation is for, to have the gas pulled by dark matter and others to enhance the early radio spectrum. The model, we're currently, uh, you know, we need some patience. Um, there's theoretical follow-up which are trying to come up with more part of this ideas. Uh, or ideas for producing early radio background, and this opens up a new 21 cellular parameter space which, for further observation, which we are exploring. But uh, we need some patience for tests, so the most important thing is an independent measurement which will verify the edges result, and uh, a few years uh, down the road, we'll have much more detailed uh, measurements from fluctuations from the power spectrum, and, uh, and this will be a real, uh, you know, this will really determine what's going on. So, thank you. Yes. So any any 
force that we don't know about that acts between variants is called the fifth force. <coughs> the point is that from lab measurements there are very, very stringent constraints for fifth force. So for this cooling you need some weak interaction, but in, mo in most cases it would be uh, enough that, would, would, that such an interaction would also occur in non variants and you would observe it in, in the lab you know, when you're putting limitations on any fifth force. So it, it rules out many, many models. The, is, can you reproduce the specific absorption profile? No, so as I mentioned, and I showed a few examples, but really all, all the theoretical models, regardless of which, which category of explanation, they all tend to be pretty Gaussian. I mean, you can produce the things that are fairly sharp, but this flat bottom, not really. So again, I, I, but I think it's not robustly really, uh, you know, established yet, observationally. So we'll have to wait for more data. I forgot from this uh, edges mid, the preliminary data is is not as flat as, as the, the first one. So we'll see how this uh, shakes out. But, but the answer is basically that it, it looks a little bit... Uh, Some criticism about the observations. <coughs> what? The main criticism about the observations themselves. Yeah, so I, think, I think the main criticism is that the result depends uh, somewhat sensitively on how you do the formula subtraction. So if you start adding uh, even one more term, you get uh, you get rid of much of the signal. So they claim that that I mean, from modeling this, this is what you expect. The signal itself is not uh, extremely smooth, but it's fairly smooth. But if you add enough foreground mm -hmm. foreground terms, you can remove most of the signal too. So they they claim that you know, they still they stand by well, what they showed. This this based on the simulation, the way they're doing it, it should be uh, reasonably reliable. Any final question? That's it. Run again.